Okay. Well, before I start the presentation on the today's topic, uh, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Maklava for giving me an opportunity to talk about today's uh, issues in Korea. I remember, well, I have kept sending emails to him quite annoyingly, <laughs> asking for his advice uh, on what uh, we Koreans should do uh, to go forward for uh, the wage-led growth. Well, as we, uh, as we all know, uh, he has edited and contributed to a book uh, about uh, the wage-led growth strategy proposed by ILO, which is I International Labor Organization, uh, in 2013 uh, with his colleague, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, on top of that book, he is one of the big names in the development of post-Keynesian or Kalaskian uh, model of growth and distribution, <laughs> which indeed provides some theoretical foundations for wage-led policies. Uh, as a matter of fact, 2000, I mean, the, a 2013 uh, ILO book influenced a lot of Korean people. After uh, the year of 2007, uh, presidential, there was a presidential election, and after that year, the Korean society underwent uh, some kind of a political backlash. I mean, ultra uh, right wing governments had abused uh, their power in suppressing the labor movements and uh, voluntary activities of some uh, uh, various civic groups, uh, labeling them as the followers of North Korea. So in 2014, one of the left, which is very minor, one of the left parties had been declared illegal by the Supreme uh, Court and forced to dissolve. Well, it was just a few years ago. Several congressmen who were elected by citizens lost their positions forcefully, and one of them had been jailed due to his allegation of anti-government activities. At the height of power abuse and authoritarian setback, people started to light candles. That's how the so-called candle revolution has started in Seoul, Korea. It was October 2016. Literally millions of people gathered together in a big square in Seoul and asked for a restoration of democracy and social reform. Well, uh, <coughs> the book of, I mean, IL, um, 2013 ILO book, uh, which was about the prospect for a more uh, democratic, more equitable, and more humane uh, economic growth, could be uh, admitted and observed by at least some of uh, Korean people fighting in the open square in the deep winter of Seoul. At last, people succeeded in impeaching the former president peacefully. Now she is in jail. We had a presidential election in May 2017, so after impeachment. The newly elected president, President Moon, promised an income-led growth, which is a version of wage-led growth, adapted to the Korean economic situation. Today I will present about the first year experience of this income-led strategy in Korea. However, I do think that people in Europe simply don't know about Korea well. So, uh, do you know, have you heard about Gangnam Style or? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure. What about BTS then, <laughs> BTS? Yeah. Okay, well they have a big concert, I mean, last month in Berlin. And uh, do you have a, uh, is there anyone who knows BTS here? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, oh yeah. <laughs> I have two daughters and they really like BTS, so you're just like them. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> okay. And also, I think you, uh, there are some of you who have a Samsung 
smartphone maybe, right? Or, or you, maybe you have seen LG uh, refrigerator or something like that. Yeah. Um, or Hyundai Motors or Kia Motors. Okay. Okay. Well, so I'm going to uh, start brief introduction to the Korean economy here. Okay. Well, the Korean economy is the 11th largest in the world as of 2017. I mean, the size of economy. Bigger than Russia. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Australia. Oh, my God. Okay. And gross national income in terms of purchasing power parity per capita as of 2010 is a uh, little bit less than Spain, 17, and Italy, 18. Human Development Index. This index is reported annually by United Nations. As far as I know, this index reflects the literacy rate and uh, average years of schooling and the investment in education and something like that. As you see, Korea is just after United Kingdom. Okay. Oh my God, where is France? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> well, I didn't make this. I I didn't make this up. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. Next slide compares uh, GDP per capita some of some countries. As you can see, okay, where is South Korea? Okay. Okay. You can see the South Korea there. Uh, Korea was very poor until 1970, but after 1970, it grows very fast. Just comparing two years, the year of 1970 and 2010, then we see that there was a tenfold, tenfold increase. So 3,000, from 3,000 to 30,000. So uh, you can find a very fast growth graphically. Okay. Uh, there is a United, Ki United Kingdom and then Spain and there is South Korea and it goes like. Okay. Well, also you can see a uh, quite severe blip uh, here, which is around late 1990s I mean in South Korea. This was due to Asian financial crisis. Other than those years, overall, the Korean economy has steadily grown quite long for decades. Okay, and this uh, plots uh, the annual uh, growth rates of GDP per capita from 1960. Uh, annual growth rates were on average higher than OECD, uh, I mean usual OECD countries. Yeah, the red line is South Korean and the black line is OECD average. Well, gap is now narrowing now. Well, but we had a really hard time historically. Well, this is a picture taken from uh, Korean War, which was in the years of 1950 through 1953. We had a big war between North and South. And I know there were a lot of uh, French soldiers sacrificed at this Korean War. Also Canadian soldiers, yeah. Everything was destroyed at that time. And people starved to death. We had to start from literally nothing. Maybe owing to the rapid industrialization after 1970s, the 24th o o Olympic Games, I mean Summer Olympic, uh, in games in 1988 uh, was held in Seoul, Korea. This picture here is not taken from the Seoul Olympic. Uh, I think this is much recent one. The flag uh, the players have on their hands represents a Korean's wishes for a peaceful reunification of two Koreas, North and South. And somebody coined the term of the miracle of the Han River, where Han River is a, a river that flows in the center of Seoul. There was a huge change in effect between 1950 and nowadays. 
The pictures are Gangnam area, which is the most prestigious area in Seoul. The 1953 was the year when the Korean War uh, ended. Next slide contrasts north and south at night, seen from the satellite. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> you can see a documentary here in this YouTube link. Its running time is about nine minutes, and it has a funny title, which is Asia Rising. Uh, okay. Okay. I can provide you this. I mean, this fifty slide later. Okay. Well, but things are not that good enough now. Recently, we see that there is the the collapse of middle class going on in Korea, in the sense that the proportion of uh, middle income households in deficit increased. Well, this can be uh, quite worrisome. Last but not least, the fertility rate has fallen significantly. Well, we have grown very rapidly, and our fertility rate uh, shrinks very rapidly also. As you can see, the ratio has fallen very rapidly as the economy grows. This is highly problematic because the reproduction of society itself does not seem to be guaranteed. Well, sometime in later, you can see the I mean, news uh, I mean, on TV uh, that oh, there will be nobody in South Korea anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> in my view, this problem is connected with some gender issues which are traced back to the traditional uh, oriental culture, such as uh, primogeniture, or something like that, where sons, are, sons were usually treated more valuable because of their I mean, labor power uh, for farming. Many Koreans are not still, they are not still accepting the desirable social changes with more opportunities for women now. This needs to be definitely fixed well, I'm not saying this because I have only daughters. Okay. Well, this picture is taken of the World Cup supporters in Seoul in 2012. Korea and Japan co-hosted the World Cup games. Okay, this time I go through some historical developments and more structural issues uh, to help you understand the background of the recent income-led uh, growth strategy. Okay, let me start from the political background. Well, as you can see, I forget about the long, I mean, old story. Let, let's start from 1948. Uh, as you can see, the modern history of Korea is characterized as, well, you can see the undemocratic, undemocratic, again, undemocratic, and in the mil military coup, military coup, yeah. Well, the Korea uh, is characterized as the successive rules by undemocratic leaders, Ri, General Park, and General Chun. Do you know who, which one is worst? One of, out of three. Guess who? <laughs> it's hard to tell who is better. Yeah. President Park in the middle, who ruled Korea for 18 years and was shot to death by one of his close subordinates. I think I can dare to say that the worst is President Chun, the very last one, who has massacred about 2,000 civilians, employing the military power of a special force troops in 1980 at Gwangju area. That was a true tragedy and a big shame in modern Korean history. After Gwangju massacre in 1980, Many Koreans fought for democracy. The university students and workers were in the lead. In Korea, anything connected with Marxism or other alternatives were strictly forbidden by the law. It was prohibited until the victory of democratization movements in the year of 1987. So at the, at the bottom, you can see the democratic changes since 1987. 
Well, Korea has been through some important changes in industrial structure. Yeah, industrial structure. But the main driving force of economic growth was export. Export was and still is the true engine of growth. And the economy could get out of the trap of uh, chronic trade deficit and debt increase during the late 1990s and turned into a net creditor country after 2000. When Daejun Kim, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, was in power after the Asian financial crisis. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the recent uh, pol uh, policy uh, shift. I mean, the, the income-led growth strategy in Korea. I will go through some policy performance selectively and evaluate them well, through the lens of uh, post-Keynesian viewpoints. Uh, my presentation can be about some quite specific policy issues or in, instead of being about the overall paradigm. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, the slide here shows the recent evolution, I mean, since 1990 or 1998, uh, evolution, uh, evolutions of labor income share on your left, yeah, on your left, and Gini coefficient on your right. Uh, so you can see the downward trend in the wage share. Well, but in Korea, the self-employed workers count more than 20% of total employment, which is much bigger than OECD average. Uh, so in this graph, I adjusted the official uh, labor income share statistics uh, reported by the Central Bank in Korea uh, by subtracting the income of the self-employed sector, uh, both from the denominator and the numerator. Well, this is a rather standard way in Korea of adjusting the effect of self-employed uh, sector. And you can see here the apparent downward trend since the late 1990s, so right after the Asian financial crisis. Uh, the next uh, graph on your right is about the Gini coefficient. It is going up, so uh, it means uh, in income distribution is getting more and more, I mean, unequal. Again, here the red line is the official uh, statistics reported by uh, National Statistical Office in Korea. Uh, and I adjusted uh, the uh, statistics uh, because um, some researchers in Korea think that the official statistics do not exactly reflect the richest households. The blue line is the adjusted one so that we can reflect more correctly the inequality of income. Again, we see the trend of widening income gap. Uh, in July 2017, the Moon, the new president, uh, Moon's administra administration announced a new government's economic policy direction. Uh, it was subtitled The Transition of Economic Paradigm. It's a big name, right? This was to shift the I mean, existing keynotes of growth policies in the face of the reality that low, low growth has become stalled and polarization has been intensifying since the mid-1990s with the limitations of existing catching-up type growth strategies. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, income-led growth is a, a corresponds to a Korean version of wage-led growth proposed by ILO as a strategy for global economic recovery. And you know, uh, as you know, uh, uh, wage-led growth is a uh, paradigm is originally developed by post-Keynesian economists. Uh, and this paradigm understands wage uh, not only as a cost, but also as a source of uh, effective demand. Uh, well, since the income-led growth strategy 
is a growth policy which demands a transformation of an economy in its nature and structure over time. We believe that it may take years uh, for uh, the policies to fully work out. Uh, okay. And this table summarizes the incumbent government's policy direction for income-led growth. As you can see, uh, they emphasize uh, three tasks. The first one is uh, to increase the household income. Well, but this is like, I mean, it is not specific for working class. It is just, for, I mean, it is for the general household. And number two is uh, expansion of social safety nets. And then, uh, number three is a kind of a supply policy, which is uh, human capital investment. Well, uh, I know it's getting bored now. Uh, before going on to policy issues, let me first uh, go over a little bit of theoretical issues. So I'm going to be more bored, more boring, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, the concept of wage led growth is uh, not very new in the history of economics. There were quite long standing controversies about the nature of the recessions in the 1970s. Well, don't ask me about this, ask your professor. Yeah. While some believed that the recessions were a supply side crisis, others believed they were due to lack, lack of effective demand. Then in the 1980s, the basic formulation, as you see the raw thumb, the basic formulation of the wage led growth theory was represented in the growth model it's by Rothen, 1981, and Dodd, 1984, to name only a few. Uh, well, these works by Rothen and Dodd and other writers uh, were efforts to generalize the principle of effective demand to long-run growth. Okay, when we consider the more equitable growth strategy, we may become faced by the following question. In what aspects post-Keynesian wage-led growth uh, can be distinct from a pro pro-poor growth or inclusive growth, which were proposed by some uh, international organizations recently? Uh, well, all these, I mean, wage led growth, pro poor growth, or inclusive growth, I think they share the vision of correcting uh, inequality and they support uh, redistribution uh, policy. So they have uh, many things in common. However, in my view, uh, wage led growth theory needs to be distinct uh, from the rhetoric, the story of inclusive growth. Well, my view, the story about inclusive growth now is not based on any firm economic theory. It is based on some observations and empirical findings. However, we don't really see any systematic growth models supporting their ideas. I think inclusive growth story is rather a political rhetoric in that respect. So wage-led growth is uh, different because it is based on economic theory. Uh, the most important difference lies in the recognition of the wage-led growth theory uh, that redistribution alone cannot be enough. I mean, can be far from enough in correcting today's excessive inequality. And also, the redistribution policy alone can be easily susceptible to political pressures from rentiers and capitalists. Instead, I think the wage-led policies try to inter intervene in the primary distribution of income between labor and capital uh, in the form of policies and institutions. Well, so uh, hence, the correcting the primary income distribution between labor and capital is critical in wage led growth theory. In this sense, the relevant policy target is wage share. Success of wage led policies hinges on 
how successfully we can uh, raise wage share. So support for the bargaining position of labor is at the core of policies. Uh, then can we really raise wage share? Isn't it the case that wage share is endogenous instead of being a policy variable? Uh, I think that a 2012 study by uh, Stockhammer again uh, shares some lights on this issue. In his study, he found that there is a possibility that uh, we can influence wage share by interventions in the form of poli policies and institutions because it is not wholly dependent upon uh, technology or market equilibrium. Well, another common criticism against the uh, wage-led growth theory is that uh, wage-led growth theory considers only one aspect. I mean, uh, you know, do you know Cyclops? Cyclops is a monster with only one eye. I think it is in the Greek, Greek myth. Uh, so uh, they always argue uh, against the uh, post-Keynesian theory and wage-led growth uh, theory uh, and they argue that we just uh, look at the demand side and we have only one eye. However, this is not true at all. Contrarily, neoclassical growth models consider only one aspect, which is the supply side. Uh, well, mm, a critical component of, I think I can say that, a critical component of post-Keynesian growth theory is the hysteresis effect and path dependence by which the historical development process of an economy affects its uh, future course of evol evolution. So we believe that the evolutionary path of our economy is shaped by various factors including demand side uh, developments. Demand and supply. Uh, Post-Keynesian growth models relate aggregate demand and aggregate supply to income distribution under the name of uh, demand regime and productivity regime, respectively. Whereas uh, neoclassical AD and AS are, I mean, independent of each other. So um, uh, some of they are orthogonal. I mean, uh, in the statistics terminology. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, contrarily, uh, post-Keynesian demand regime and productivity regime can be thought of being interdependent and determined simultaneously. Yeah. And well, uh, there is one more. Post-Keynesian theory identifies three aspects of the relationship between uh, income distribution and economic growth, which are regimes for demand, productivity, and employment. Okay. Uh, well, Keynes once argued that uh, lower wages curtail, um, I mean, the effective demand and thus uh, employment. Uh, this idea of Keynes uh, reveals the theoretical um, and possibility of uh, the concept of, I mean, I mean wage-led employment regime. Uh, it is known that uh, we employment regime is uh, wage-led uh, when the demand regime is more strongly wage-led than the productivity regime is. But uh, empirical results are not definite. In case of Korea, there is a study. There is only one study which argues that the Korean economy is now wage-led employment regime since the late 1990s. But I mean, the evidence is not very definite. Uh, well, let's look at the figure on the employment regime. Uh, we assume there are two output goods, X uh, and Y. Uh, here I have plotted production possibilities frontier. Please don't think of me as a neoclassical because I have plotted it as <laughs> 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 concave. Okay. Uh, uh, with, I mean, with the help of this graph, I want to decompose the employment effects of income-led growth over the long run. Okay. 
before we implemented uh, wage-led policies, our economy was at 0 0.80. Uh, and our production possibilities frontier was PPF1, I mean, inside the dotted line. Uh, it should be uh, noted that in the capitalist economy, uh, productive resources such as labor power and productive <coughs> capacity are not fully utilized in general. <coughs> so involuntary unemployment is prevalent. Hence, uh, we are not on the frontier. We are inside, under the PP PPF. Over time, okay, we have done some uh, wage-led policies. So there will be a, an expensive effect of increasing effective demand. So our economy will move out to 0.81. But still, I mean, but that's not the whole story. There will be some increases in labor productivity over time uh, through various channels. This technological progress will shift out, I mean, outward the present uh, production possibilities frontier from PPF 1 to PPF 2. Therefore, uh, we have now PPF 2 and we are at A1. Look what happens in employment. The rate of employment may not rise in the course of wage-led growth. Okay, but we have another thing. We can think of feedback effects running from higher productivity to increases in accumulation because it can stimulate investment. Then we can think that our economy moves again from A1 to A2. Okay, so we are moving out, but still we are under the PPF2 because we have uh, involuntary, uh, I mean, involuntary unemployment. Hence, the totally, the combined effect of if demand regime and productivity regime is the movement from A0 to A2. So can, you sure, can we be sure uh, the rate of employment go up? I don't think so. This shows that uh, in income-led growth does not promise job increases. One big issue recently in Korea was about job losses. I mean, after the present government launched the I, um, income led growth program, uh, we experienced some kind of job losses. And uh, many people criticized on those things, and there were heavy political battles. The I mean, newly uh, elected uh, President Moon, his administration kept on emphasizing their uh, promise that they would become, so to speak, job government or job creating government while pursuing income led growth. I do not think this is not really consistent approach to income led growth. Since uh, we don't have any strong conclusive evidence that the employment regime in Korea is truly wage-led. I think the present government seems to be pursuing mutually inconsistent goals at the same time, in my view. Well, more recently, nowadays, I mean, we are, I mean, we are, I mean, we are defeated at the political battles, in a sense. And the government ceased to embrace the necessity of uh, income-led or wage-led uh, strategy. In fact, they, I mean, uh, to me, it seems that uh, they want to get out of the political battle debates around income-led growth now. I mean, this uh, shows how poorly their policies were based on the post-Keynesian growth theory. It was really uh, disappointing. So I was, I mean, talking about uh, too long about the employment regime, I think because it was one of the most important issues uh, in Korea. And I think there will be other, if there, if there is other country who is trying to uh, pursue uh, wage-led growth, then 
the same problem can happen anywhere, I mean, in the world. Uh, and I believe that there are two strategic tasks in wage-led strategy. Uh, these include an increase in wage share on the one hand, and on the other hand, we also pursue a reduction in wage inequality. It is uh, now uh, well known that the more equal wage distribution is, the stronger the wage-led nature of the growth regime is. This outcome is because the propensity to consume decreases in income, even among workers. Uh, in this regard, rather than just wage-led growth, wage equality-led growth can be more accurate expression of our growth strategy. Okay. Well, now uh, we are bored enough, right? Yeah. But I still have mo a lot of time, right? Yes. And I have a lot of slides now. 20 minutes. Only 20 minutes? We can take okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My slides have uh, 95 pages, something like that. Okay. Mm. You know, well, I, I've been, I, have, I have been presenting some policy issues at uh, the policy conference in Korea uh, several times. and. Uh, every time I have presented, uh, I could not finish, I mean, because <laughs> 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 time limit, always. Uh, at this moment in time, uh, uh, okay, I, uh, well, I, I think I have uh, talked too much about the employment regime. Okay, now let's move on to the real policy issues uh, in Korea. Firstly, I will go over labor policy. Uh, basically, uh, I, I would say that the present government is not very friendly with trade unions. The ruling party now uh, was formed against the military, I mean, they were formed against the military dictatorship a long time ago. So they were not based on uh, I mean, labor movements. Uh, they claim that they would pursue the way I mean, as ILO had once proposed, uh, they once promised it, promised it. But in fact, there was no progress in the ratification of ILO core agreements and the improvement of the legal system for it. <coughs> and there was no progress in the institutionalization of beyond firm level bargaining structures, I mean, industrial collective bargaining. Well, we don't have that kind of system now. So uh, many people argued for the industrial collective bargaining system, but uh, nowadays the government is not doing anything on that. Uh, and there was no progress in the institutionalization of workers' particip participation, the decision-making of some relevant policies. Mm. Uh, well, I think that uh, reforming the labor market institutions so as to support the bargaining power of a working class corresponds to the very major premise of wage-led uh, policies, but disappointingly, there were virtually no progress. And oh, okay, well, there were also some positive changes which are not really important. Uh, President President Moon once announced uh, the era of zero non-regular workers in the public sector. Well, in Korea, uh, we have our uh, labor market is uh, severely segregated. So there is a uh, market for, uh, I, mean, I mean, regular employment. I mean, where we can, um, I mean, have a, we can, uh, job security is guaranteed and um, highly paid, something like that. And we, ha uh, we are protected from uh, big uh, trade unions, but also at the same time we have a uh, I mean minor uh, ma market for uh, non-regular employment. Uh, they usually don't have any trade unions and they don't have a bargaining power and they just I mean uh, they are very uh, job security is not guaranteed and usually a very low wage. So. Uh, we have a very segregated dual labor market. 
So uh, president has uh, once promised that there will be no non-regular workers, at least in the public sector. That was his uh, promise. So many people liked him at the time. Uh, it was May 2017, so it was just right after his inauguration. So according to the guidelines he once presented, there would be a conversion of this number of uh, non-regular positions to regular ones. It was truly a big step forward. Most of all, uh, num the number of convergence was unprecedented. Moreover, the government uh, introduced the non-regular employment abuse restriction system and the principle of direct employment of regular workers. And also they have done some more progressive things also. However, there were some caveats. Firstly, there were too many, too many exceptions to the conversion. And there was a concern about uh, failures in correcting wage inequality because most of the conversions were shifts to the unlimited term contracts. And the treatments for the unlimited term workers are not very different from uh, the non-regular workers. Uh, the most problem problematic decision was that indirect employment using subsidiaries was allowed as a way of conversion. So uh, uh, there will be a, still a dual uh, labor market unchecked in Korea. Okay. I think I have to skip over some slides. Uh, okay. Also, uh, we should consider about institutional uh, issues very seriously, uh, especially I mean, institutional affinity issues, uh, because there were no great changes either in managerial practices or in performance evaluation system for public companies. This means that we have a very long way to go uh, for protection of non-regular workers. And I kept on arguing that one of the first things to do for the government pursuing uh, income-led growth is the institutional reformation protecting unorganized and non-regular workers uh, such as amending uh, the some uh, relevant acts but there was uh, nothing going on i have i have uh, kept on arguing these uh, things uh, since last year nobody here Okay, let's uh, go back to the end of February uh, 2018. At the time, the government amended the Labor Standard Act, uh, changing the maximum working hours per week from 68 to 52. Yeah, yeah I know Professor Lava and all of you guys are now quite shocked uh, at hearing how hard we work. Yeah, yeah we are not very happy. Well, in my case, I mean, in my case, after graduation from graduate school with an uh, MA degree, I entered a finance company uh, where I worked as a credit analyst for corporate bonds, something like that. Uh, there I usually worked until 3 a.m. And in the morning, I went to work until 10 or 11 a.m. I mean, so uh, I spent almost all day at work. That's why I keep working and started PhD study. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, wage policies. Yeah. Wage policy is the key instrument for income led growth uh, along with mar uh, labor market institutions reform. The government, the Korean government, uh, raised the minimum hourly uh, wage. Uh, a lot, yeah. Uh, first, uh, we need to understand some background of the min recent minimum wage raise. Uh, okay. Well, a number of minimum wage workers are a key source of income in their households. Okay. More than 60% of minimum wage earners are solely responsible for the household livelihood, according to the official statistics. And you can see a simplified wage distribution in Korea. All workers are uh, grouped now into uh, five uh, quantiles based on their income. 
And if we consider the cost of living, uh, yeah, the, the second point, the cost of living, if we consider the uh, cost of living data provided by minimum wage council, we see that from the first to fourth, so almost 80% of workers, it is hard for an individual worker to bear the full cost of living for three-person households. Uh, this is just based on official statistics. About half of workers are not earning enough for the livelihood of two-person households. So, uh, however, I'm sorry, okay, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah. And more than 70% of the minimum wage households have more than three family members. Uh, well, of course, this situation may have contributed to the very low fertility rate recently observed in Korea. This is the background for minimum wage raise. So, right skewed and left leaning distribution. Okay. Okay, I have to start uh, speed up. Okay. <laughs> Even today I cannot finish, okay? Uh, okay, uh, the Korean economy features vertical division of labor between contractors and subcontractors. Uh, so, I mean, the large public companies or Jebel, such as Samsung or Hyundai, uh, they are located on the very top of the uh, vertical hierarchy. Uh, and so, and the typical firm's capability to pay wages uh, and the typical wa worker's wage income depend on the position in the vertical uh, structure. Uh, this is uh, really hierarchical. Uh, for example, treatments of the workers in the second vendors should not be inferior to treatments of tertiary sub subcontracted workers. This factor can be really important in Korea because uh, minimum wage raise can be highly effective tool in affecting wage share. I think there are two structural causes that are at work. Uh, the first one is skewed wage distribution and also the second one is vertical hierarchy. If the effects of minimum wage raise are directly received by the third vendors, Wages in second vendors automatically rise due to the hierarchical order. So we have oh, this kind of graph. The red one sh shows the minimum wage, the rate of minimum wage raise, and the blue one is wage share. Uh, in Korea, since 2001, 2001, the minimum wage. Uh, uh, act, uh, a minimum wage was started to be applicable to all the industries. So, just, uh, start from 2001 until recently, we see a very tight match between them. Uh, so, uh, uh, the yeah. Okay. Yep. So uh, on the right scale, it's still always a decrease, uh, increase, and on the left uh, scale, it's like the same. Uh, yeah, right. Yes, yes, yes. So how come that we have uh, we have a quite decreasing wage share while we have still an increasing uh, minimum wage of like almost 2% or more than 2% in 2010? Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, so right. The yeah. Well, I mean, just, I, mean, I, mean, I just want to show the close tie between these two graphs because uh, at first glance it was really surprised. I mean, it was I mean it was surprising to me. Uh, this so I mean, I don't think out about other countries, but mm, in Korea I think uh, the two structural causes that I mentioned uh, can explain something about this phenomena. But in case, uh, in fact, uh, since we have only very short time series data, we cannot perform any systematic econometric uh, analysis now, but we can just I mean, visualize uh, the thing. Mm -hmm. and it's nominal, it's, uh, it's nominal. Yeah, nominal. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, okay. Uh, so, wow, there was a rapid uh, increase in minimum wage rates. I mean, 16.4 percent for 2018, and again for I mean next year, 10.9. So cumulatively, it's almost like 30 percent. So. Uh, Wow, it was uh, really so shocking, and um, a lot of objections were there. I mean, from both sides, uh, and because uh, em employers were really unhappy because the small scale self-employed self businesses and the subcontracted small and medium enterprises are argued to be in a state of difficulty immediately after the minimum wage raises. Also, the workers were unhappy because the minimum wage of 2019 is still less than 60% of the cost of living for workers' households. So there was a lot of uh, political battles around this uh, minimum wage raise now. Yeah. Okay, also uh, we had some concerns over the employment situation. As I said before, uh, things are really bad and after well, since uh, we have done, we don't really have uh, uh, enough time series data. Still, we cannot do any econometric systematic analysis, but we can visualize what's going on here. And I try to uh, decompose a simple uh, factor analysis, and I found that uh, some, I mean, deteriorations in, I mean, decrease in uh, labor demand uh, may contribute uh, to the weakening uh, in employment situation nowadays. Okay, but uh, uh, most systematic analysis of the labor market uh, uh, done by a Korean uh, labor institute, which was reported uh, in early August, uh, they could not find any significant evidence for the negative effect of minimum wage raise. I think uh, this is um, uh, most reliable uh, analysis not, uh, until recently. Okay, so um, maybe I have 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. I think I have to uh, skip over the. Um, okay, overall diagnosis. Yeah, so we have been through some rapid increase in minimum wage. Uh, so we can overall, uh, I mean, we can diagnose this. I mean, we can, uh, uh, the, uh, the current condition of our economy uh, can be said uh, that uh, wage income increases. And this uh, leads to, this led to an increase in the average household income. So there was an improvement in the quality of employment on average. Uh, well, since uh, there was some kind of a conversion to uh, regular employment. But household income of the self-employed sector decreased, uh, partly due to the minimum wage raise. But declines in income do not seem to have led to a severe uh, decrease in employment. That's the overall diagnosis uh, until recently. Okay, and we can have to, uh, we have to check other complementary measures. Where in Korea, uh, we uh, termed uh, I mean income led growth instead of wage led growth. Uh, income led growth was a plan to raise the income not only of workers but also of small businesses altogether, uh, reflecting the Korea's economic reality that the self, self employment sector accounts for more than 20% of total employment. Uh, then can we support incomes of workers and the small businesses altogether without any other measures? Is, I mean, besides minimum wage raise? I don't think so. So in that sense, I think the conceptual concept of income-led growth conceals some kind of internal inconsistency, I think. It was really predictable that uh, the minimum wage raise can impact negatively on small businesses' income, at least in the short term. Uh, anyhow, once the government has promoted income-led growth, then government should have prepared timely support measures for 
the small businesses. For example, they should have uh, strengths in uh, social safety nets or should have done some legislative complementation to correct unfair uh, business practices uh, done by some large jebel corporations in order, in order to protect the economical weak. But until recently, other than the minimum wage raise, there were virtually no other policies that were felt by citizens also. Even nowadays, Korean government is running budget surplus. There is uh, a severe austerity bias in the Korean society. Budget for 2018 increased a lot, but still not enough because it is just 7%, but uh, Korean, Korean economy is expected to at 3% uh, in real terms. And so if we add inflation, then it's, it will be about 6%. So 7% is not expensive enough. Okay. Uh, IMF has uh, estimated that Korea government is run, run right now uh, is in, I mean, they, uh, we are, I mean, co doing contractions in macroeconomic policies. This is a structural balance. Uh, IMF, I mean, estimated by IMF. So the fi passive fiscal policy, so make it more difficult for the recent policy to work out and to settle down. And difficult, uh, it, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay. Mm. All right, I don't really have time, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just can skip. <laughs> All I can do is just skip now. <laughs> All right, prescriptions, prescriptions, okay. Uh, I think I can say that there are some uh, urgent prescriptions for the income led growth policies in Korea. Firstly, fiscal expansion is definitely needed for pump priming, extending social safety nets, and job creations. Also, we need revision of uh, some related acts for the economic democracy uh, so that uh, the small business can be protected from uh, the large uh, conglomerates. And the revision of the commercial building this protection, something like that. And mm, the another thing, another uh, issue uh, is about the policy arrangements. Well, it may take quite a long time uh, for the current uh, income-led policies to settle down uh, in the Korean economy. So uh, they I mean, social conflict, I mean, managing social conflict can be a really important uh, task for our government. Uh, so there should be, I mean, very transparent and clear definition of the vision and the goal and, uh, I mean, operating framework for uh, this type of uh, income-led policy. But there are a lot of internal inconsistency inherent in the project of income led growth nowadays I see. What are target variables? What are operating instruments? How they are related? And there are no answers for that. So I believe uh, we need more systematic approaches. Uh, based on post Keynesian I mean idea uh, contained in the growth model, I think uh, the idea, I, can, I think we can make some kind of ideal policy framework for wage led growth. So primary intermediate target can be a wage share, I mean labor income share. Also we have a co complementary intermediary target, uh, which is wage distribution and household income distribution, maybe asset inequality. And we have some operating instruments, I mean tools, policy tools. So primary tools can be uh, labor policies of various institutionalizations supporting workers and wage policies, floor and ceiling for hourly wage. And also we have some other uh, complementary operating instruments, which is uh, welfare policies and uh, some uh, employment safety nets importantly. Yeah. So my 
Final proposal is this, an idealized policy arrangements. The first one is primary policy instrument, and the second one is complementary policy instrument, which is uh, institutional measures for managing uh, variabilities of wage share. And the last one is supply side policies that combine traditional gross policy tasks. So I think I can finish my presentation. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to start with the presentation about the first year of, of income-led growth uh, policies in Korea for a post-Canadian uh, uh, view. Uh, so I will uh, make a, small, a short introduction, and then uh, Matthias uh, will talk about theoretical issues. Mm -hmm. Then Babur will talk about labor and wage policies. Then I will go back with complementary issues and the review of the impacts of the policy on employment. And then Matthias will close with some estimations and uh, conclusions. So in July of, um, of 2017, uh, the government uh, announced a new economic um, uh, policy direction uh, to face the problem that um, economic uh, GDP uh, growth was uh, low and becoming stagnant and the polarization between um, profit share and labor uh, and wage share was being intensified since um, mid-1990s and this new economic policy direction was called the transition economic paradigm and the idea was to alleviate the downward trend of, of a wage share by raising the minimum wage to by 16.4 percent no yeah it's still there yeah <laughs> um, the theory behind is the income led, led uh, um, uh, the income led growth uh, uh, which is the Korean version of the wage led growth uh, which has been developed by post Keynesian economists and the ILO and the main uh, idea is to focus in um, func uh, functional income distribution, which is the strength of the bargaining power of the labor by intervening in primary distribution through policies and institutions. And here we have a graph of um, GDP growth and adjusted wage share uh, as a percent of GDP uh, from 1971 in 2000 to 2016 in South Korea. And we see how both um, indicators follow a downward trend so we can see that uh, maybe the adjusted uh, the, the wage share has some impacts on uh, GDP, and Matthias will explain uh, the reasons behind this. Okay, uh, maybe speaking yeah. about the reasons, it's a bit yeah. ambitious, yeah. but <laughs> I'll do my best. No, um, okay, we were planning to present very briefly the theory behind the Kaletsky model, but I think due to time constraints, yeah. maybe it's not the best thing. I mean, I know that B and C options already know about this, but maybe for A option, it's been a claim, but. Uh, I just wanted to really introduce the, the basic concepts of the Kaletsky model. Basically, Kaletsky is a Polish, was a Polish economist uh, who, who wrote a lot of the insights that Keynes uh, developed in his general theory, but he was unfortunate enough to write in Polish, uh, so nobody really paid attention to him at that time, uh, and Keynes got all the fame, but he, among these, these discoveries or these insights, one, the most important one, I would say, uh, or a very important one, is the... Um, the, f the principle of effective demand, demand, the idea that output is determined not by the existence or the availability of resources, labor and capital, but by aggregate demand. Um, and basically supply follows demand, uh, and in the general case, of course, um, because we're continuously under full capacity utilization. Um, and uh, the, the, the main insight of Kaletsky and economics, I would say, is linking growth and aggregate demand with income distribution because the, the, the underlying principle is that saving rates, I mean, we have a class analysis and we have two classes, workers and capitalists, which is workers uh, which earn wages and capitalists which earn profits. And the idea is that they have differential saving rates. So workers basically consume all or a big part of their income while capitalists save more. And this, so an income distribution skewed towards wages would increase aggregate demand. That's like a very, very, very basic story uh, of what would be a Kaletsky model, but in the slides I put together a very simple model which you can go through if you want based on Professor Lavois book. I think it's uh, without taxation to keep it simple. Um, but basically we have three main insights derived from the Kaletsky and economics. The first one is obviously that exogenous expenditures would, would be investment or public expenditure increase 
aggregate demand. Um, the second one is that the multiplier, which is this is something that Keynes didn't explicitly say at least, uh, is linked to income distribution. So what higher in an income distribution directed towards wages increases the multiplier and therefore output and employment. And second and third of we have the Keynesian paradox of thrift that we all know that increasing saving rates in the economy reduces output and employment. Um, so what and in this regard, some oh there was not magic there, but anyway. Um, so two, regard, two insights that Professor said that I found particularly interesting in this regard. The first one is that um, that the focus of the Kaletskian theory on primary income distribution and functional income distribution is based on a, I mean, it's based on a class analysis, on a class approach, and focuses on the distribution between, on the primary distribution within wages and profits. So it's very different from the poverty, inequality, alleviation um, focus of the main institutions, the IMF, the, um, the World Bank. And it's something that I think it's very often over, I mean, overseen or not really discussed uh, from the Keynesian, post Keynesian point of view. We just like go directly to primary income distribution without, without really focusing on why are we choosing that and we are not considering secondary income distribution. And I think that is quite relevant and you, you explained it quite clearly. Um, and second of all, well, the particularity of the Korean economy of the importance of self-employment um, and the relevance of mixed income because, you know, I mean, the, the simple model has only wage share and profit share, but actually when we go to the national accounts, we have three components of, of the GDP, which are profits, wages, and also mixed income, which is the income of the self-employed. And in Korea, this is really important. 26% of the population in 2015 or 16, if I'm not wrong, were self-employed. <laughs> Um, so it's important to discuss how we fit this in a Kaletskian or a post-Kaletskian model. Do the, the mixed income earners, do the self-employed population save more or less than workers or than capitalists? Um, how, how this affects the, the conclusions? And this is basically the same figure that Carolina showed you before, only decomposing, um, I mean, what Professor, if I'm not wrong, you show the adjusted wage share, right? So adding up the wages and mixed income. Is that right? I had uh, subtracted uh, mixed income from the denominator and numerator. Also ah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Because we went to a MECO database and we got like this decomposition. Um, so the blue lines is the self-employed income and the um, gray one is the non-adjusted wage share, which is what we consider traditional wages. And we actually found that like the, the decrease in the adjusted wage share responds a decrease in the self-employed income, why that what we traditionally consider wages increased. Um, so maybe, of course, there are techniques for imputing, that for computing part of self-employed income as wages. But I mean, this this is quite a particularity of the Korean economy and of the trend, and poses some questions about if Korean economy is wage-led or not. Which I mean, I think more empirical work is needed on that regard. So later, if you can have a few words about that. I think it would be interesting. So then, Baburu, which... Oh, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, um, my name is Babur. I come from Uzbekistan, option B. Uh, so now I want to talk about uh, labor policies and wage policies in Korea. Professor Anna has focused uh, quite a bit in his presentation about this, but due to time constraints, um, he was not maybe able to cover some stylist facts, and I'm going to present them. And uh, let's begin with the Moon's campaign promises. The President Moon, the reason why he was elected, maybe it's interesting to look at what kind of proposals he has done. First of all, concerning labor policies, he said that they need to limit the use of non-regular workers. What are the non-regular workers? Like who are, the, who are they? So they are people who have part-time employees, who are part-time employees, fixed-term employees, and uh, dispatched workers and in-house contract employees. On the contrary, regular workers, according to Korean labor law, those, they have permanent, indefinite employment terms. Uh, so why is that an issue? <coughs> Following now, non-regular workers currently account for 40% of all workers in Korea, which is, uh, of, of course, it's down from 55, that was in 2000s, but still it's uh, um, above the OECD average. And also, besides the ratio of non-regular workers, 
is higher for people in their 20s, like young people, and also for elderly people. And also the income gap between regular and non-regular workers is currently at 60%. So this is the issue that needs to be tackled. And labor, what kind of mm, measures the Moon administration has proposed is to guarantee equal pay for equal work, imposing restrictions on hiring fixed term and uh, part-time employees, and also levying fines from large corporations that violate the rules. So, second proposal was concerning about creating more public sector jobs. In Korea, there are about 1 million uh, public sector employees, and that's about 10% of all Korea's employment base, which is, uh, again, lower than OECD average. And that's why President Moon has decided to improve this measure by 810,000 more employees by the end of his five-year term. In addition, he also wants to convert 30, uh, 300,000 non-regular workers to permanent employers. But in the article by Professor Nye, it was written that it's only 3% of the total non-regular workers. It's a very tiny m amount, actually. Okay, concerning the third option is to reduce working week to 52 hours. As was said, um, Korea, Korean workers had to work before 68 hours. Now they, are, they have the right to work only 52. And out of this, 40 hours is for ordinary hours, like uh, weekdays. And the uh, overtime hours can be just maximum 12 hours. And people are, are prohibited to work on Saturday and Sundays before it was allowed. So now it's, it's not. If you look at the following graph, you can see that Korea has one of the highest uh, measures of uh, longest working hours in the world, and is third after Mexico and Costa Rica. And this is an issue because Koreans tend to work more than most OECD countries. In who do you guess is the which, which is the uh, lowest working nation in the world? What do you think? Yeah, you are right, Germany. Germany is like 1,300 <laughs> something hours. So. But they have very high productivity. <laughs> so, we <have> the <laughs> so we have the following question. Are Koreans really stressed out? So, According to the experts, South Koreans, as was shown in the picture, work more than 2,000 hours a year. And it's third highest estimate. And also Koreans um, it's like, because of this, it's believed they have one of the lowest birth rates in the world and also aging society, because people tend to spend less time with their families, and this is an issue also. But as was mentioned earlier, working longer is not a guarantee that they provide higher productivity. In fact, their productivity is lower than OECD average. So. Here's the quote by President um, Jae-in, he was saying like, it will be an important opportunity to move away from a society of overwork and move toward a society of spending time with families. The most important thing is that it will be a fundamental solution to protecting the lives and safety of the people by reducing the number of deaths from overwork, industrial accidents and sleep deprived driving. People also say that in Korea, the suicide of the industrial workers is one of the highest in the world because of working pressure. So what kind of official steps have been made so far? Korea officially dropped the maximum work week to 52 hours on July 1st, 2018. According to the new government rules, um, public institutions, government offices and uh, companies that employ more than 300 employers uh, are going to be the first to follow these rules, but they are given six months period to prepare for this change. And also, healthcare and transportation sectors are excluded from this program. And small businesses are given for uh, like time till 2020 to implement the measures. And uh, for the violation of the law, companies will be required to pay almost $18,000, and uh, executives can be put in prison up to two years. Okay, fourth measure, a uh, fourth proposal by President Moon ad administration. It was about preventing companies from blacklisting the employees. Some of the companies um, 
according to Korean practices, they target some of the employees that they want to fire and put them in the blacklist. And this is kind of sad and it's a discriminatory measure, I think. And besides, the employees who voluntarily decide to submit their resignation can revoke this decision in two weeks' time. So they have some time to change their mind. And the fifth, uh, better employment opportunities for young people under 35. Uh, it was basically saying that large companies, like private ones, have to employ young people, and uh, the share of young people should be about 3 to 5% of the total workforce. And lastly, uh, th the government proposed to, the president proposed to increase the minimum wage to 10,000 won by tw 2020. So, if you look at the following picture, we can s I took this from the website of uh, One Labour Party. It was a picture from 2015, and you can see that people are protesting. It's like a labour union. They're asking for, okay. Uh, to raise the wages to 2,000, 10,000 won. And one of these uh, promises has, has been made by the government. So let's move on to the wage policy. As we can see, like in the seven years prior to 2018, minimum hourly wage in South Korea was raising at uh, single digits from 5 to 8 percent, and it has Im increased uh, from 2017, increasing by double digits. Okay, let's. So, why is minimum wage raise is powerful policy tool in Korean economy? As uh, Professor Na said, uh, on the top are uh, chaebols like family owned enterprises and the second tiers, first vendors and second vendor companies. So, if we raise the minimum wage, the effect goes oh, sorry, from the bottom to the top. So, in fact, increasing the wage share like this. So, wage share increases, goes up. Uh, but there are some caveats of the policy for higher wage, uh, for higher minimum wages, is that according to this abstract from Korea Herald, uh, the bottom 20% of uh, people, they experienced uh, uh, that the incomes have declined by 8%, and it was one of the sharpest decline from 2003 while at the same time, top 20% have gained their earnings by almost 10%. And it's because of the minimum wage rise. So, in fact, people uh, have been deprived of their low-wage works, like jobs. And uh, from my side, the final slide is about one step forward and two steps back. I would say that recently, uh, Korean parliament has passed a law that allows monthly bonuses and allowances to be counted towards the minimum pay, minimum wage pay. So if before like you worked uh, and gain, uh, get money for working hours, now your minimum wage was calculated also based on your bonuses and allowances. And uh, it was like a cheating and uh, a lot of labor unions are against these amendments to the law and they're protesting, I think, still. It would be interesting to hear Professor Nas comments about this. Okay, so two main objections that the paper uh, makes about this policy is that uh, the minimum wage rise uh, is far from being enough to stabilize the lives of low-wage workers, since the minimum wage applied to 2019, I guess there it has been already determined, uh, is less than 60% uh, of the average of living, uh, of living for worker, a whole, uh, uh, workers' household, and is still being below uh, the average cost for a single worker. Also, uh, governments should uh, have examined how um, this uh, minimum wage rise uh, would, ha would have affected um, small businesses since they represent a big part of employment in South Korea and they have low productivity, so incre uh, increasing uh, minimum wage would squeeze their uh, profits and it would have negative uh, impacts on, on employment. Uh, so, some um, um, complementary policies, uh, measures they could um, use is um, a use a expansionary fiscal policy since the government is running surplus um, in areas such as housing, uh, childcare, uh, medical care. Also, they should have um, uh, actively, actively work to mitigate the problem of uh, poverty in the elderly um, uh, to manage the 
the negative size of uh, uh, a minimum wage uh, and also to correct inequality in households uh, income distribution. Also, they should have expanded uh, employment in the public sector. And since the public sector is not big enough, they expand uh, employment, but it's still being uh, pretty small. And it should be great if employment uh, increases in the private sector, but the government shouldn't wait. Um, uh, also, they, they rise uh, um, income tax uh, rate uh, to the highest income group. Uh, however, it wasn't enough. Uh, since uh, the rise uh, in the tax bundle in Korea is like less than 20%, and for the average OECD countries, it's around 26%. Uh, other policies they should have implemented is uh, sorry, <laughs> establishing um, supporting measures to improve uh, the ability for self employed and small and medium enterprises uh, to pay wages uh, by strengthening the bargaining power and by increasing the responsibility of large uh, upper firms. Otherwise, if only um, the rising minimum wage is perceived by uh, small uh, businesses, this could uh, severely weaken their um, income base and the, the whole idea would be as um, uh, self-contradictory. Also, they should um, um, run, um, regulate uh, through legislation the abuse of ownership rights, such as excess, excess, excessive rent increases. And they should uh, strengthen uh, social safety nets, uh, such as uh, uh, unemployment insurance and basic livelihood security systems. Um, so some impacts uh, on employment of the policy, um, where there has been discussion on whether the, this policy uh, had neutral or weakly negative impacts on, on employment, since employment has been deteriorated, but we don't know if it's because of the, uh, the minimum wage rise. Um, but there is something clear is that more research uh, studies needs to be done. But uh, a study run by the Korean Labor Institute uh, determines that there is no evidence that the minimum uh, wage uh, increase had reduced the number of jobs in the first half of 2018. Also, uh, the paper estimates that the reduction in employment from February to August of 2018 uh, it was due to a decline in the labor supply by 37%, and the rest, 36%, uh, uh, it was due to the decline in labor demand. Um, another reason why the deterioration of employment it hasn't been caused by the rising minimum wage is that the self-employed workers uh, with employees has continued to increase, and self-employed workers without employees or unpaid uh, family members has decreased. Um, but um, w uh, the sector that, uh, in which employment has suffered the most is the manufacturing sector. However, we don't know if um, this is because of the rising minimum wage, because it can also be due to sluggish investments in one of uh, the reasons of uh, growth uh, in 2017 was uh, investment, and investment has uh, dropped dramatically in 2018. And also, it can be due to uh, structural problems in in the industry. Um, yeah, I think now you can. You know, particularly in that regard, um, I mean, we found very interesting your claim that uh, an element that explains partially the, the reduce in. In labor demand is related to the manufacturing reconversion and like some sectors that are not doing that good. So we went to, we wanted to add a, a sectoral dimension to the analysis. I know we are kind of running out of time, so I'll try to go to the, through this very very quickly. Um, but we calculated some multi. Oh, the color is quite bad. Okay. Anyway, uh, we calculated some the, the basic multipliers for the Korean economy based on the Y of the input output matrix for 2014, if I'm not wrong. Um, and basically on the x-axis, what you can see is uh, considering all the inputs that are required to produce one unit of each sector, uh, so how many, how, how much does the whole economy produce directly and indirectly to produce one unit of final demand on each sector, while on the vertical axis, you can see basically one unit of production in each sector creates more inputs available for other sectors, so they are used by other sectors to produce more. Um, so basically we have four quadrants and the northeast quadrant will be the more virtuous one because it's what we call the key sectors, are the sectors that by producing require a lot of input from other sectors. So they create more demand uh, backwards and at the same time they are used by other national sectors and therefore they create more production um, forward. And you can see, well, the orange balls are the um, manufacturing sectors, while the gray ones are services and the primary ones are in blue. And as you can see, the orange, well, it's not very orange, but whatever. 
um, but the orange ones are basically on the key sector or in the sectors that have a high backward linkage. So I think it's quite, um, I mean, your, your picture of the relevance of the manufacturing sector for labor for in the productive system is quite accurate. But when we go to the um, creation of wages and labor, um, oh, sorry, that's the key sectors. Um, but then we calculated also the um, employment multipliers and the wage multipliers, which basically includes how much wages and how much employment are hiring or paying each sector. We see that the key sectors are more focused on services, while the manufacturing sectors apparently they pay lower wages, or which was totally surprising for me because usually the manufacturing sector creates, a, I mean, good employment, form unemployment, good well-paid employment, and and what we didn't find that they are in what we would could call uh, the key sectors. Instead, they they tend to pay less wages than average and create less employment by average directly and directly per unit of production. Uh, and instead we find a lot of services over there that are still the size of the bubbles is the number of direct employments in each sector and you can see manufacturing sectors are still very relevant. Even though they have lower multipliers, they are relevant on employment. But still we find a lot of service sectors in, in these uh, key sectors. And I think two groups are particularly relevant and could add a sectoral dimension to, to the analysis. First of all, the, the, um, the sectors asso associated with public expenditures, which are, well, first of all, public administration, which is, can you see the mouse? No, okay. Public administration, which is like a big bubble in the middle of the key sectors, and also education and health, which are like the main uh, sectors in which the public sector spends. Um, and second of all, some, what we call, I really don't know the word in English, probably, knowledge incentive intensive sectors, maybe the sec option A knows better than me, but like R&D or uh, other professional services, administration, marketing, legal services that <coughs> seem to have like very interesting multipliers and be able to create a lot of employment per unit of production and well-paid employment. Um, so I think a sectoral transition towards those sectors and with more public expenditure could be a virtuous pattern and not necessarily a negative one. Um, so, ah, yes, again, you have the key sectors, but anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically the same I just said. Um, but yeah, to sum up, I think, well, for, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And if you can give us some comments on what we commented, I think it would be very helpful. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Do you prefer to collect questions and then answer, or first answer yeah, this, yeah. which is, I think, quite a lot? I've been seeing yeah, you writing. Uh, there were a lot. Uh, Maybe you want to move here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Una lista sin que se haya anotado ya. Ah, I think you're not. You don't need this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, whenever it rains, it pours, right? <laughs> I cannot remember all things, in fact. I cannot remember whole things. So, uh, okay. Uh, the last thing, okay, from the last thing, <laughs> I will start. Uh, you have uh, shown the manufacturing, I mean, what was it, production multiplier? Yeah. And you have uh, some analysis on uh, the input-output table. And was really, mean, imp imp I mean, really impressive. Uh, and you, know, you're, you are right. I mean, right now, nowadays, uh, when we uh, look at the composition of manu manufacturing sector in detail, then we see that uh, right now uh, the the manu the I mean, employment generating capability of the manufacturing sector is going down and. That's why, I mean, you can have uh, these type of uh, results. And also, you can see some importance of the uh, service sectors in employment, right, yeah. Uh, but uh, we uh, have to consider another thing that uh, we cannot uh, uh, discover uh, from this type of uh, input-output table analysis. Uh, in Korea, uh, we have some major, I mean, special, uh, special area for industrial complex. Uh, so if there is, once there is a big, I mean, plant where there is only a couple of workers are working, it is a big, I mean, I mean, heavy industry, 
but uh, I mean around that town. I mean there will be a town around that industrial complex, and we're, so in that area, a lot of service employments are created. I mean that way. I mean it cannot be traced uh, uh, from uh, this I kind of yeah yeah I O table, but uh, we feel that manufacturing sector is really important and has some important. Uh, propagating effects uh, as far as uh, employment is concerned uh, because we have this type of uh, industrial complex things like that. Uh, so well mm, yeah you're right and our industrial structure has uh, kept changing so uh, and also we uh, we all know that uh, employment generating capability is going down in manufacturing sector since well look at the semiconductor I mean, when we are like Samsung, then they, they, they just don't hire the workers. I mean, they don't need, I mean, in fact, yeah. So telecommunications, something like that. So uh, uh, in case of auto industry, yeah, they employ a lot of persons, but uh, they have very strong union. <laughs> so uh, they try to do some, I mean, they try to employ, I mean, uh, non-regular employment. That's the problem right now, and actually they are losing competitiveness now. So uh, the most, I mean, efficient, uh, uh, I mean, employment generating sector used to be a auto industry, and Hyundai Motors they are losing competitiveness. I mean, uh, nowadays we we don't see any Hyundai cars around here. No, so. Uh, S Samsung is okay, but Hyundai is now getting very bad, I mean very worse, so uh, in that sense, Hyundai is going down and many people are losing jobs and the service employment around that area is going down also, so uh, in that sense I have uh, mentioned uh, the problem is mainly from the manufacturing sector, yeah. I think I've seen you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Answer and then we make the questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you've been talking about the importance of the manufacturing sector and now the start of the auto industry. Oh. And sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, you've been talking about the importance of the manufacturing sector and um, the struggles. What? <laughs> oh, <laughs> my name is Sophie. I'm from Option V. <laughs> um, and um, I was wondering to what extent you can compare South Korea um, with its exports to Germany and to what degree the growth models that have been run in the past years are similar. Also with the relative, I mean now it's a new approach towards wages, but as you said it's a very ambiguous execution. So what to what extent actually are these both countries following the same growth pattern, this idea of export-led growth. Um, you mean Germany? B Germany and South Korea, to what extent are they comparable? Because from just looking at it and what you've talked about is that um, the issues are similar in a certain sense. Oh. You also have you have this pressure on wages. Um, yeah, that, that, you that have this dependence on the manufacturing. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Oh, but in fact, I'm not <laughs> very aware of the yeah. German economics. So <laughs> I mean, um, I think I cannot answer. I mean, enough to you because I don't really, I don't really know about uh, German economy. So, oh, I am sorry. <laughs> I will learn it. <laughs> yeah, it's related. Uh, I'm Tore from Option from Option C, and I think like just to that point, I think a big difference is that if you would compare the average wages in the sectors, you would have a different uh, dynamic for Germany. I think it's more usual in Germany that you have the low paying <laughs> wages on average in the um, in the service sector and that the manufacturing wages are actually quite high. And I think when you compare that, uh, like when you link that to the export channel, that gives a different pattern for Germany than for South Korea maybe. Oh, I think that can be common things in Korea. I mean, in the service sector, uh, there are many low-wage workers in service sector in Korea. In manufacturing sector, we usually they have a strong union, so uh, I think they are getting paid uh, quite high. I mean, better than usual. I mean, 
uh, teachers in uh, elementary school or I mean yeah right. I'm not really sure but anyway this is I mean comparative things also but you may be right yeah uh, no I, I was just like because the one slide uh, that you that you the plot that you did that showed the average wages in the different sectors right yeah. Next one? Yeah. This one? And I was the x-axis is employment per unit of output and the y-axis is um, wages per unit of output. Directly and directly. Yeah, and this was what I was referring yes, to. This is what okay. Yeah. Mm. And actual services and marketing is also something that is tied to the bank. Yeah, yeah, def de de definitely, oh, definitely. Yeah. I just saw like on on average uh, I think the I, f I think it's mm. not as usual that the manufacturing sector is on the on yeah, the, the lower yeah, on yeah, the yeah, lower bound. Uh, yeah, yeah. I now I see uh, what you're saying. And yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is different. What I <laughs> different from what I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I can yeah. understand, but we'll see. Okay, yeah, so. The uh, manufacturing sector is exporting a lot of uh, raw material or intermediate yes. goods, mm. and that's why our subcontracts. I mean, it doesn't mean that the wage, r wage rate is lower in those industries. No, 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 no. No, it's, it's just the wage per unit of output. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, because we're including intermediate inputs too. So it might be a. And what unit of output for uh, education? One dollar of value added. Yeah. yeah. And for education? One dollar of value added. Like the okay. same yeah. way. Yeah. National accounting. Okay. Like the. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe okay. let's move on. So. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say something else or we should just. Well, uh, in fact, well, well, I think we can go, I mean, for the yeah. So you're uh, first on the list and we yeah. only <laughs> give you like three times. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I am Zaid Ali, option B1. So uh, one of the slides mentioned that uh, South Korea had like huge capital inflows during the three undemocratic successive like governments in the form of private loan and IMF loan and oh, yes, so yes, much. Yes. So I was interested to know like what were the major policy shift after the 1990s which led South Korea to repay the international debt and at the same time do so well in terms of GDP growth. Because I think Pakistan, I'm from Pakistan, we are stuck in a very similar situation and our government is going for IMF bailout and looking for international debt. So I would really interested, like I'm really interested to know what were the policies because here we talked about the wage policies, but what were the positive policies which helped South Korea to come out of this? I mean the, the crisis in the United The international United debt and then coming out of, you know, Mm. Doing well in terms of GDP and well, growth. in fact, uh, during the Asian mm. financial crisis, uh, the exchange rate uh, has gone up really high, and so it was really, I mean, it was really shock to us at the time. So uh, th the students abroad, I mean, who are studying in the U.S., they had to go back to Korea because they could not <laughs> pay <laughs> anymore. <laughs> well, that was really good to our exporting conglomerate rates. I mean, they could sell Korean, I mean, items very cheap price in the United States and other countries. And so, well, we have been through uh, mm, some uh, different phases of economic development, but still I think the Korean economy can be ca characterized as a, a kind of a stereotype of uh, export-led uh, I mean country. And so that was really helpful in recovering eco economy wide I mean, so after the financial crisis once the exchange rate uh, went up high uh, Korea import uh, Korea uh, could do a lot of exports and that uh, helped in repayment of debts uh, and recovering economy and yeah basically that was what happened in uh, uh, that was uh, what, in my experience, that was really important. I mean, the exchange rate movements in Korea, yeah. Because I, I, we are, uh, we always are uh, exposed to the foreign shocks, and as you know, uh, foreign shocks are, I mean, symbolized, I mean, uh, 
in the fluctuations of exchange rate. Um, so I don't really uh, know really about your uh, Pakistan situation. It's uh, almost like something like this. Mm. There is currency devaluation, and mm. at the same time, uh, the government is trying to manage the current account deficit. So they are just looking for loan, you know, for now. Mm. At the time, the Korean government has tried to uh, launch a new industrial policies, and we uh, started a IT business at the time. That was the, I mean, uh, the point in time we started uh, uh, do doing some kind of uh, in internet network and things like that. So, uh, well, so I think uh, if the if any economy uh, was hit by a foreign shock, then uh, they should think about the new industrial policies and uh, also, mm, uh, well, it's, it's quite a difficult question. Uh, yeah, all I can say is that uh, we started the new uh, industrial policies and that was really correct. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, Samsung and other uh, electronics companies who are uh, doing pretty well in the international market. And also, uh, one uh, thing really happened in Korea at the time was, I mean, the big fluctuations in the exchange rate has helped us in uh, economic recovery. Yeah, that's all I can say, I think. Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Arnaud from Option B2, uh, Financial Policies. My question is uh, more about uh, political communication, so I'm sorry if it's not dead on topic. I was wondering when the South Korean government decided to follow um, income-led growth policies, how was that announced to the people, considering I believe that if you say uh, income-led growth policies to people, they don't necessarily know what it means. So how was that idea like explained or promoted to, to the people? Uh, well, the background, uh, I mean, as I s uh, said before, uh, we were in the middle of, uh, I, mean, I mean, civil movements, I mean, the candle, candlelight revolution, as we say, I mean. Uh, so uh, many politicians were changing into the right, I mean, left direction, I mean, uh, the r the current ruling party used to be uh, center right, but uh, during the candlelight revolution, they were changing as if they are center left. <laughs> I mean, they are just like social democrats at the time. So I mean, that's that's how some progressive economists could start work with them, and one of them is a. Uh, uh, Professor Hong, uh, whom I cited in this paper, and <coughs> he developed uh, some kind of a big sketch for our income-led uh, growth strategy. And so uh, in our case, we didn't really have any other difficult procedures or um, situations uh, while we are promoting income-led growth because it was kind of a revolutionary situation. Most people uh, were about to accept more progressive social reforms. So th th at that time, we had no problem. Yeah, all in fact, we, had, we have very strong ultra-right-wing parties. They are still occupying about half of uh, the parliaments, because uh, the parliamentary election was before the candlelight revolution. <laughs> uh, and they could not do anything at the time, because they, know, they knew that they lost I mean, support from the people. So was, uh, is it enough, or, or uh, do I have to? Uh, yeah, clarify something, but, but what I would like to explain to my friends that in the street, people protesting, they were probably not asking for 
uh, income-led growth policies. Maybe they were asking for that, but not in those terms. So how could we make a link between what they were asking and the words they were using oh, and okay. the ideas they were promoting mm. and the idea that was actually put in place? Mm. Oh, okay, yeah, as I said before, yeah, there was some kind of, uh, I mean, uh, pursuit by people, I mean, for the more progressive social reform because our wage is too low and we have so many low wage workers and that kind of uh, background was maybe working under yeah, this uh, program, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I'm Mateus from, from Option B. Uh, when we studied the South Korean development in Brazil, we studied the, the political fall, the diminishing in power of the old elites. Uh, I think the name is Zaibatsus, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the post-war uh, era as one of the main reasons for a successful development path because then they could uh, articulate a more um, concise uh, strat strat strategy of development. So basically my what question... Did, what did you say, Jairat? Sorry? What did you say, I mean, Jairat? Uh, well, I've, as far as I remember, the name is Zaibatsus, but probably it's different. Ah, but, okay, I um, okay, okay. no, I mean, yeah. mistake. I mean, yeah. the yeah. fall of the elites, the, the external powers also dismantling the elites as one of the main reasons for the development path. And, well, I would first uh, ask if you agree with it. And if you, if you ask, how, how do you see these issues in, uh, in these new strategies of development that our country is trying to, pur to pursue? Uh, well, uh, in Korean economic history, Jebu is a kind of a very interesting topic and many uh, researchers are working on that. Uh, well, Jebu, they contributed to the economic development in Korea a lot. Well, we all know that. Uh, but, well, mm, they, well, as you, as you, as you said, <coughs> They have, uh, well, they have uh, started a new business, uh, uh, and with their help, uh, we, I mean, the Korean economy could uh, start to grow, and uh, we, so, uh, well, they have done some contributions, but uh, as, the econo as the economy grows, uh, what happened uh, was that uh, they were, I mean, Mm, protected by uh, I mean power. I mean, they were I mean, closely uh, linked together. And I think there was some kind of a corruptions and uh, there was no uh, system uh, to uh, reform, uh, of, uh, reform uh, those kind of, uh, uh, I mean, undesirable practices uh, between the economic power and the political power. So they could uh, build empire. Uh, Samsung, Hyundai, well they were in fact they are like a king. Uh, they uh, built a big, um, their, uh, their own empire. Uh, and uh, they uh, usually uh, take a lot of benefits from uh, our industrial structure where Jebel is uh, uh, in the topmost tier and uh, some, I mean, the I mean eco economic weak firms, they are, I mean, in the lower positions. Uh, so well, I think uh, Jebel, I mean, large conglomerate, uh, they, I mean, I, mean, I think a civil society in Korea now, they can ask uh, for their I mean concessions uh, that I mean they have to uh, uh, bear some costs uh, uh, for uh, increasing the wage income of the labor and working class and uh, uh, increasing a business income of uh, I mean low wage I mean low profit sector 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, it is complex. In, uh, in, uh, on the one hand, uh, still they are hiring, I mean, in, well, official statistics says uh, mo uh, about two-thirds of total employment uh, are by Chebol uh, and public sector. Uh, so, uh, but still, I mean, well, we can ask for, uh, we should ask for some concessions, uh, I mean, to them. So, well, that's all I can say. Uh. <laughs> Two hard questions for me. <laughs> Thanks so much. My name is Hannah from Option B. I want to thank you again for the presentation. I find it particularly interesting to see, as a student of post Keynesian economics, as many of us here are, to see uh, one way of implementing a theoretical post Keynesian idea in like the real world. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more how this idea uh, or strategy was developed. As you said, it's just one way of implementing actually like this wage-led strategy in in this in this case the income-led strategy and if there was like if it was based on exchange with post Keynesians actually and how this exchange looked like if you were maybe even personally involved in developing the strategy I don't know and you suggested a few um, improvements to this strategy and I wonder if they will if there is a possibility that they find their way into the pursuit strategy, so if there is still an ongoing exchange with economists today regarding what they do and what the future can look like, so if we can actually maybe well, see something. Okay, economists are working with them now. Mm -hmm. And I was one of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, well, I, I, uh, I am uh, on their side, and but usually uh, I was uh, I mean closer to labor uh, unions and uh, we were criticizing uh, government's policy many times, uh, I mean from the left side. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not, I was not involved in uh, building up this type of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, strategy. Uh, well, I think I can say that we, I mean, uh, the the economists who were directly involved in the government policy, they were severely affected by uh, the ILO book and uh, post Keynesian writings. Uh, so uh, they could uh, well they could borrow some ideas from uh, the books that you you guys read. Mm. But when we started to implement the policy and we designed. The of uh, operating frameworks, uh, the most important thing, or most, I mean, most difficult thing, uh, was uh, that we should uh, make up a new program which uh, can be adapted to Korean reality. So uh, uh, we tried to, we tried really hard to uh, make up a plan uh, for, uh, I mean. Mm, I mean, I mean, we have to consider I mean, institutional differences. I think uh, any country uh, that pursue uh, in the future or at present, uh, they have their own, I mean, characteristics of their own economy. So, uh, for example, in Korea, uh, as he said, uh, uh, the, the industrial structure, which is vertically, I mean, hierarchical, is really important and that uh, structure uh, can be really uh, helpful to us in raising wage share because we can directly affect the wage share uh, using the minimum wage raise uh, policy. But uh, also there is dark side. I mean, mm, uh, if we raise minimum wage, then the all, the all, all the economic burdens can be on the most, I mean, weakest firms in the vertical structure. So if we could not get any concessions from the, I mean, top tier companies like uh, Jebo, uh, then the, f the fights will be going on between minimum wage workers and the, uh, I mean, small businesses. 
that can be the worst thing I mean, that, we can, that we can imagine. Uh, so, uh, so we learned it. I mean, we learned a lesson uh, that uh, in case of our economy, uh, we need uh, some kind of a policy for fair trade or economic democracy should uh, go together with minimum wage raise. And those kind of lessons were really uh, important to us right now. So <coughs> I think every country has its own characteristics <coughs> and that characteristic can be really important in implementing wage-led policies, I think, yeah. yeah that was our lessons. And uh, well, in fact, economists are still talking about, a lot about the, our program now and my program may be changed. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for the inter interesting talk. I'm Joram from Option B1, which is Macroeconomics and Finance. And uh, I just had a very short question. You mentioned in one of the slides, if I remember correctly, that the government used to employ quite a significant number of non-regular jobs. If that's yeah, if that's not right, then the question is redundant. So um, yeah, I was I was surprised. So. Um, what is the background? Uh, if I think of maybe other countries, the uh, government jobs are the more considered safe or permanent jobs. Uh, mm. So maybe a little bit of the history behind this, which then changed from the labor policies. Yeah. Uh, well, government has always concerned about the deficit problem in Korea. Yeah, okay. they always. I mean, I mean, they always try to save and uh, so. Uh, if I can add one more thing, in Korea, uh, especially in public sector, trade union is very strong. So we may have a kind of uh, inside-outside problem. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, governments can, uh, if uh, government wants to uh, increase uh, employment, uh, uh, well. Always, since the always uh, wage cost can be a problem, so m maybe trade unions may not like it. I mean, the increase in employment uh, because always budgets are low and I mean insufficient. Uh, so I think so. There are two forces at work. The first one is uh, government's tendency uh, pursuing a budget surplus. The second thing is a strong uh, union power, uh, which makes uh, inside-outsider division of public uh, labor market. Yeah. Okay. So we're running out of time. So uh, on this Friday, so I assume everyone wants to go home, <laughs> especially you that you just arrived. So we'll allow for three more questions. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, so Moki, Martin, and Philip. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mohib, and thank you for your talk. Uh, I think the question might be a repetition from the questions that have already been asked, but I just want to know what is the industrial structure that you have in South Korea? And what I mean by industrial structure is what are the supply constraints that you have? Are there any supply bottlenecks supply at all bottlenecks. in industry? Industry. Or if there is an agrarian bottleneck. So the second question is, I think you mentioned how there is a vertical subcontracting you know, structure. So my question is, and when you said that when there was a minimum wage increase, it adversely affected the small businesses. Yeah. So are these small businesses subcontracted by the big businesses? And has, I mean, where do these small businesses get their demand from? Especially when you are increasing wages, are they losing out on external demand? Whereas compared to, let's say, a big business like Samsung that you mentioned, it's able to automate, have a highly mechanized structure, and it can still meet the external demand. So th these are the two interrelated questions. And I would just want to know what is the kind of industrial structure you have? OK, uh, you asked about uh, the industrial bottleneck, which I am not quite sure about. Uh, 
uh, and the industrial structure itself is um, if we can help you uh, uh, do you mean this do you mean this this plot yeah yeah as you can see uh, right now well, the blue is agriculture and okay, dynamics of industry. We have mobile LCD software. Uh, yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's all I can say right now about the industrial structure. And how does increasing wages affect the knowledge economy compared to the manufacturing economy? Oh, well, minimum wage rates can affect uh, service sector directly. Uh, it can be, uh, I mean, kind of a bad factor for businessmen. Mm, in case of manufacturing, well, uh, in as I said before, uh, now Korean manufacturing sector uh, has very low uh, in generating employment. So I don't think they are not. I, I don't think they are affected a lot. But still. Uh, Service sector, since service sector accounts a lot of employment right now, uh, so in that sense, uh, minimum wage rates can affect a lot in the economy. And that's all I can say. And your next question was, uh, I, I just forgot about it. What, what was it? Uh, it was about uh, vertical subcontracting. Okay, okay. And there's loss, I mean, because the bigger companies are automated. Okay, so thanks again for the presentation. I'm Martin from Option C. Uh, I come from Belgium, uh, French-speaking Belgium, and in French we have an expression, I don't know if it exists in English, but to be the lawyer of the devil, um, the devil's attorney. So that's what I want to be right now. Um, so this, my question would rely on two assumptions. So the first one would be that um, uh, South Korea being this very uh, export-led economy with a very important manufacturing sector, um, we could think of uh, the demand regime of the economy as um, being um, uh, profit-led on a domestic side and, oh, okay. of course, uh, <laughs> wage-led on a, on a, on a, on, on the, from the point of view of the, the global economy and the, um, internationally. Um, and we so just like the contributions of my classmates show, we, we, we do have this difference between um, the manufacturing sector and the other sectors. And in order for a wage-led uh, policy to actually fo foster growth in the future in South Korea, especially since, I mean, I remember this graph where you shown that since the end of the 1990s, the wage share actually decreased and uh, South Korea kept having a very important growth rate. Um, could we see, and this is why I'm the devil's attorney, because I don't think that growth is necessarily the point. I think that equality and distribution is more important, but could we think that a way to keep fostering growth with a wage-led policy would be to have a sort of segmented labor market in which in the manufacturing sector that is uh, profit-led somehow, uh, from the domestic point of view, we would have um, bad work conditions and low wages, and another side uh, having a, another group of sectors that would actually be wage-led domestically, in which the working conditions and the wage share and the, 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 the level of the wage would be higher. And so what would you have to say against that? Okay. Uh, well, we have done a lot of empirical analysis for that, and we don't see any real differences by, I mean, across sectors. Okay. Uh, and our Korean economy is wage-led, yeah, definitely. And we have so many studies on that, and there is only one exception, which is not really important. And everyone else <laughs> agree on that we are wage-led, and that's, I mean, there was no real differences, I mean, across sectors. Okay. So, yeah. So I mean, well, wage share has <laughs> fallen, right? As wage share has fallen, and our economy, I mean, kept growing. 
if we employed some kind of wage-led policies, then we could be better, I think. Okay, so uh, yes, oh, um, I have the pleasure for the last question. My name is Philip from Option C2. And um, yeah, so first of all, I share um, the devil's attorney opinion that distribution and equality uh, is more important than growth, maybe, especially in the future with uh, a demographic transition to, to come. But um, I would like to better understand um, uh, the, the relation between the different growth regimes in South Korea, however. So, because we all know that South Korea has really focused on these industrial policies, um, picking winners, as Ellis Emston says, um, the table, you said that the hierarchical structure um, in the past, so really focusing on the production side. And now there is that, sh that shift, a uh, potential shift to an income-led um, uh, growth regime. So, so what, is that, what is that relation? Is it just like an interim victory of trade unions, or is it really a fundamental shift? Um, from one regime to the other, What's, what, what is your stance? Well, I think uh, the profit-led regime and uh, I mean the difference uh, between profit-led regime and wage-led uh, regime uh, is that uh, where uh, the most important demand comes from. I mean, uh, since Korean economy has gone through uh, development as a ex uh, export export-led countries. So in a sense, many people at first glance uh, can see uh, that maybe Korea can be profit-led because they are export countries. But in reality, the biggest demand component comes from the domestic demand, I mean, consumption and investment. So uh, in that sense, uh, in case of Korea, uh, still uh, the wage-led policies like, uh, I, mean, I mean, raising minimum wages and something like that, it can help boosting uh, domestic demand. And domestic demand is kind of a, I mean, bigger portion than export. <coughs> That's why we have a wage-led regime, yeah. Um, okay. Is it enough or? Yeah, uh, OK, OK, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, thank you all very much, and thank you, Professor.